do you want some water? Yeah. Attendees are still on hold, so I don't think they can hear this one. I just went into our Can you answer? The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only <coughs> mode. Good morning and good afternoon. This is Linda Chesson, the chair for the DHPE Board of Directors, and I'd like to welcome you to DHPE's annual meeting and its first virtual meeting. To avoid phone charges, use the VOIP option in the audio tab and listen through computer speakers. All attendees are mute through the virtual meeting. This meeting will be recorded and made available in members only group. Type questions into the question box for questions to presenters. Questions will be verbalized to the presenter by a moderator for answering. And type in a message into the chat box for technical difficulties which will be directed to a DHPE staff member. Voting and motions will be conducted by asking voting members to raise the hand icon. Close all other windows except for GoToWebinar for the best quality. Click on full screen mode in the upper right hand box. DHPE is required to hold an annual business meeting, so I am calling the business meeting to order and asking for approval of the minutes of last year's business meeting posted on the website as shown on your screen. If you have comments or questions on the minutes, please type them into the bo question box at this time. Voting members, if you are willing to make a motion to approve, please click on your raise your hand icon. Panelists, please type your motions into the chat box. Linda, we have a motion by Michelle from Ohio. Michelle has made a motion to approve the minutes as written. Is there a second? 
Danette from Hawaii has seconded. Danny has seconded the motion. Is there are there questions or discussion concerning the minutes of the last business meeting? Linda, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. So there be no further questions or comments. All voting members in favor of the motion to approve the minutes, please click on your raise hand icon. Linda, we have a majority voting yes. Thank you. And the motion carries. Thank you. That was very seamless. Thanks, Danny, for your help on that. At this time, I would like to turn to the association and the treasurer's report and our committee reports. The complete association treasurers and the committee reports are posted on the members only section of the DHPE website. Because our time is limited today, I will share highlights of those reports. I hope you've had a chance to review the reports before today's meeting. If you have questions or would like to make comments, please type them into the question box as the committee summaries are read. I'll start by uh, providing a brief summary on our the board report. Um, this has been a very strategic year for DHPE. Our new executive director, Dr. Susan Gessler, has set the course for the future for DHPE. The board, guided by Susan, has set into motion clear definitions about the decision-making role of the members, the board, the board chair, the board treasurer, and the executive director by specifically establishing a matrix outlining the operational, programmatic, fiscal, personnel, compensation, legislative, and regulatory areas with respective levels of decision-making authority. This has been an excellent tool for us as we guide uh, the staff and help the board uh, make decisions for this organization. DHPE continues to operationalize its CDC cooperative agreement through tight fiscal management and, and, have been, and there have been audits to be reflective of our management practices in the fiscal area. We're continuing to look at diversification of our revenues, uh, making sure our personnel policies are accurate and reflect current practice, and developing an operational operations manual for our office. The D, when we learned about uh, program dollars uh, that were restrictive concerning our annual meeting, um, the in-person meeting, uh, we found that we would not be supported through current CDC grant guidance. So the DHPE staff and board members designed a venue to keep members engaged. And there, this is where we're at today, a virtual meeting, our very first. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Wendy uh, Sally, the DHPE Director of Information Technology Services, who has masterminded this entire meeting today, along with Susan Gackler and her guidance, and the DHPE Board Planning Committee, led by Danny Kennaway of Washington State, Rochelle Hurst, Michigan, Chris Lyman of Thane, Margaret Murphy and Jane Andring. Without their uh, guidance and involvement, this today's meeting would not have taken place. I appreciate all the hard work. The board also approved um, membership of various standing committees. Uh, our board's an active board and involved in many different areas. Our standing committees that you'll hear more information about in a little bit uh, are representative of the executive committee that I'm providing right now from the board, but also the nominating committee, our health policy committee, finance and audit, and the annual conference. All committees have been active and demonstrated uh, and will be demonstrated by their annual reports that are provided today to you. Our ad hoc committees focusing on health equity and school health, evaluation, publications and resources, and website design have also been active in supporting DHPE strategic focus. Our organization continues to collaborate with existing and new partnerships, and we continue to strive to improve communication technology through our new website design, email communication, and webinars. 
What I'd like to do now is turn to Melissa Olson to give the treasurer's report that you'll find online. Thanks, Linda. Uh, for 2011, DHPE had a clean audit, and we ended the year in the black. Our overall net assets and total revenues increased. Um, however, membership dues account for less than 1% of our total revenues, which is problematic for a membership organization. Um, almost 95% of DHPE's budget is from one cooperative agreement with CDC, uh, and DHPE's leadership is exploring several avenues for diversifying our income, including restructuring dues and their membership. Thank you, Melissa. As I mentioned before, DHPE has several committees and many dedicated members who have given generously of their time this past year. The Finance and Audit, the Audit and Finance Committee was reactivated with a small but dedicated group. They revised and solidified many of the DHPE's core accounting and fiscal management policies and procedures. In addition to now being able to review monthly financial reports, the committee recommended updating DHPE's personnel policies, changing the fiscal year to allow for better budget planning, and changing the fee structure for shaping policy for health that better aligns with the actual cost. The annual conference planning committee plans the annual conference and business meeting and oversees the annual award process. Originally, the committee planned for the change the committee has worked to create this a virtual meeting that includes the required and annual business meeting and also builds knowledge of current public health issues presents awards and is interactive and informative the health equity committee has identified ways to assist members in incorporating health equity concepts and techniques with everything they do, while also ensuring that DHPE is constantly considering health equity with everything they do. Members of the internship and fellowship, of the internship and fellowship have provided equity. guidance to the health equity committee and the Internship Evaluation Committee. The program has created partnerships with new minority-serving institutions and intern placement sites and met with potential funders. The subcommittee is planning an advisory meeting for September where we will review the results of an evaluation of our internship program. Supported by the DHPE-approved Strategic Health Policy Framework, the Health Policy Committee identified and acted on three funding office priorities and one legislative priority, completed two policy briefs, one on health communities, healthy communities, and one on the public health education workforce. Together with SOFI, committee staff developed the first series of budget impact stories. Committee members attended and served as faculty in the 15th Annual Health Education Advocacy Summit. DHPE members and staff conducted more than a dozen Capitol Hill visits regarding DHPE funding and legislative priorities, signed on to 26 congressional letters, and participated in health policy activities with eight national organizations. The School Health Committee addressed reductions in funding and changes in staffing and membership. Sarah Bowie, the um, SCW Program Manager, resigned her position at DHPE. While capacity building assistance programming was put on hold, the School Employee Wellness Program continued to grow. DHPE conducted two school employee wellness webinars. I will hold a strategic planning meeting next week to discuss next steps for the program. DHPE developed a stronger presence in the overall school health community by taking a leadership role with the School Health Advocacy Coalition and hosting meetings of CDC-funded school health organizations. The membership parameters work group considered the structure of DHPE membership and the benefits 
and needs of DHPE membership by conducting a membership survey, comparing benefits offered by DHPE and other organizations, reviewing historical discussions on membership, and reviewing processes in place for administering DHPE membership outreach. As a result, DHPE has retooled marketing and processes to recruit and retain members and has recommended to the DHPE board options for improving DHPE's membership structure and benefits. The Partnership Parameters Task Group created guiding principles to assure that the mission of the Directors of Health Promotion and Education is supported appropriately and to provide guidance to both DHPE members and staff in pursuing financial relationships that address transparency in negotiations and maintenance of ethical standards. I'd like to provide a huge thanks to all the DHPE members who have devoted time and energy to this important work. So voting members, if you are willing to make the motion to approve all reports, please click on your raise your hand icon. Linda, we have a motion from Barb in California. Thank you, Barb. Is there a second? We have a second from Tim in Arizona. Thanks, Tim. The motion has been moved and seconded. Is there discussion or questions? Linda, I'm not seeing any questions from the members. Okay. Having no questions or further discussion, all voting members in favor of the motion to accept the report, please click on your raise hand icon. Linda, we have a majority of voting members approving. Thank you, Danny. The motion carries. Thanks, everyone. At this time, um, in our agenda, we have um, the presentation of awards. And I would like to turn this portion of the agenda over to Jane Andreen, our awards committee chairperson. Thanks, Linda. DHPE confers awards in several categories to recognize the importance of public health education, health promotion, and the health equity work that we do, as well as to acknowledge the accomplishments of our members, uh, community partners, and allies. This year, I'm very excited to say we have four awards that are going to be um, given out today. The first is the Hogg Ogden Award, which honors a person whose imaginative and creative efforts have a positive influence on the advancement of health education and health promotion for his or her state or for the nation. This award honors the late Hod Ogden, whose distinguished career in health education and leadership provided the groundwork for many of the chronic disease prevention and health promotion programs that are currently funded at state and local levels. Hod was the creator of the mythical health education philosopher known around the world as Mohan Singh. Hod Ogden launched national programs on tobacco reduction and cardiovascular disease prevention, and he left a legacy through written Surgeon General's reports. I want to extend congratulations this year to Mariana Chilton for her vision, passion, and creativity in giving women living in poverty a voice in the national dialogue on hunger and poverty. Hello, my name is Mariana Chilton, and I'm very delighted to be the recipient of the Hod Ogden Award for Creativity in Health Education and Health Promotion. I share this award with my friends, the women of Witnesses to Hunger. They're true heroes, and because they're willing to share their lives and their experiences with the rest of their friends, what they show us is not always so pretty, but what they can speak directly to legislators, 
and to the public. They can educate others on their, um, um, on their own behalf. And really, they can assume their positions of power that they truly deserve. I want to see the potential that the women I work with have um, and to know that they all have um, experience and we are trying to teach others about how to improve their health. I think they have so much to learn from people that we supposedly are trying to help. If we just ask them what it is that they need and allow them to frame the issues that are most important to, to them, we can learn from them and we can make sure that they're the ones who are taking the leadership roles and they're the ones who are teaching others about themselves. So I think that the only thing that's been creative is the fact that I've gotten out of the way and made sure that other women have a microphone and can speak for themselves. Ultimately, I think we'll be our judge is the children. They're the ones, their health and well-being is the ultimate indicator of our success. I'm very thankful for this award, and I'm, I wish everyone well, and I hope that uh, we can continue to learn from one another. Thank you. Congratulations, Mariana. Congratulations, I feel like everybody Mariana. should do a I feel thumbs like up everybody now. should do a thumbs up now. The second award is the Health Promotion and Education Advocacy Award, and it honors a person for his or her advocacy to further health education and uh, as a profession, and or who has served as a champion in promoting the science of health promotion and disease prevention at the state or national level. Nominees are also uh, Nominees are also accepted under this category for policymakers who promote prevention efforts in public health. This year's award goes to Jeffrey Le uh, Levy for serving as a champion, advocate, and leader in promoting the science of health promotion and disease prevention at the national level through his leadership for the Trust for America's Health and on the National Prevention Strategy. I'm so honored to have been given the Health Promotion and Education Advocacy Award. I accept this on behalf of my colleagues here at Trust for America's Health, who have all contributed to our mission of making prevention a national priority. The last two years have been an incredible time for raising visibility and prevention promotion in the public arena. Through the expansion of our nation's investment in prevention through the Affordable Care Act's prevention and public health fund, and in the growing attention that's being paid to the impact of policy systems change on health, an area that DHB has been such a leader in. It be particularly gratifying to the members of DHE to see your long-term commitment become central to the national health debate. That said, we continue to face huge challenges, seeing never-ending attempts to cut back or repeal the prevention and health fund, and ongoing attempts to cut the species, but a pennywise, pound-foolish approach to addressing the fiscal crisis our nation faces. We at TIFA have been so grateful for the partnership with DHPE and having a strong philosophical companion in this struggle. We look forward to continuing our work together to create a nation that values health and health equity. Congratulations on your first virtual meeting, a wonderful new approach to national meetings, and again, my many thanks for this award. Thanks, Jeffrey. The State and Community Collaboration Award honors statewide or community group efforts that have resulted in evidence of coalescence between the state or community level constituents by demonstrating innovative health education and health promotion practices at the state and community level. This year, we are very excited to announce that we have two awardees. The first goes to New Jersey for an innovative program that has helped many New Jersey residents manage their asthma. And the second one goes to the WIC program with the Department of Public Health, the city of El Paso, Texas, for inspiring many Texans to improve their diets and push for a food system that is just, fair, sustainable, and nourishing, and I assume also tastes good. The Directors of Health Promotion and Education in Washington, D.C. is very pleased to present the State Community Collaboration Award to the asthma program for the New Jersey Department of Health here in the state of New Jersey. This award is for a community approach to improving asthma self management Now this is for an innovative program that has really helped many New Jersey residents. I'm to our director, we're going to present this award to you, Lisa Jones, Paul, Melissa, and Landa, Laura Hanano-Pay on behalf of the Health Promotion Education. 
which is a few words. And we have other ways to educate women under this award. We graciously accept this award given today by the Directors of Health Promotion and Education, in addition of the hard work that the teachers has done in trying to reduce the burden of asthma and despair on our better than this nature. Thank you very much. Oh. Hi, I'm Celeste Care. I'm the President of the Civil Department of Medical Science, Director of Health Promotion and Education Work, and Day 20 of the Community Collaboratory. The goal of the program is to certify qualified residents who will pass on to the county in critical stages of development. Make a sense when you determine that to prevent these problems. As principal today, directly at the mission of our organization, we see the beginning of helping to efforts and collaborate to reach more passengers and increase awareness for Food Day 2012. The Department of Public Health Work Program has been named coordinator of the Food Day 2012 has received a grant through the Power Health Foundation. We will continue to date EHP, our collaborative efforts for today, and other questions about us. Thank you. This has been a year, been a, year. a lot of legislative turmoil at federal and, federal and federal state levels. State levels. We are pleased to have as our keynote this year, Nicole Kunko. Nicole is the Chief of Public Policy with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. In this role, she is responsible for federal government relations and state health policy activities. Prior to joining ASTO, Nicole served as a professional staff for the Labor, Health, and Human Services Education and Related Agency Subcommittee of the Committee on Appropriations of the U.S. House of Representatives. In that capacity, she advised members of Congress on annual funding levels for discretionary programs within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Before working for the U.S. House of Representatives, Nicole was a budget analyst at the U.S. Department of Labor and at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. As Nicole makes her presentation today, type your comments or questions into the question box, and Danny Kennewake will moderate the questions. I hope everyone can hear me, I, and I've sh shared my screen. Um, thank you all so much. Um, first for the work that you all do in support of public health, and thank you for having me today on your first ever virtual meeting. Um, I'm truly honored to be part of your meeting today. I've always had um, a great relationship with DHPE members. Um, when you all came up to visit me on Capitol Hill, um, and now that I'm at ASTO, I appreciate the close relationship I continue to have with you all and our joint advocacy efforts on behalf of public health. So today, well, well what I've been asked to do is provide a federal uh, budget update and um, what, tell you what's going on in here in Washington, D.C., although I know many of you are, are very well aware of what's been happening in, in D.C. Hopefully my screen is going to work. So I'm here to just talk about the overall political and fiscal environment at the national level, and, and certainly as we consider the future of public health and the opportunities and challenges before us in the federal policy arena, it's better, it's really critical to understand the climate in which federal funding and policy decisions are being made and how to navigate and position public health within that. Um, so first, we'll just start with a profile of the 112th Congress, the folks that are in Washington, D.C., making these decisions. This is just a quick uh, graph that shows you, um, obviously, there are 100 members in the U.S. Senate. This is their distribution between Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. The two Independents do caucus with the Democrats. So there is a, a majority Democrat uh, support in the Senate. On the House side, 435 members. Um, we have four vacancies currently in the House of Representatives. Just one announced this week, um, Jeff Davis from Kentucky resigned from his position in office, but we have other vacancies from Washington State, uh, New Jersey, and Michigan. And this is the makeup. On the House side, we have a Republican control of the House. Uh, this slide is quite busy, uh, and I'm going to quickly go through it. Um, what you see on the left here, this shows you um, the seats that have changed hand between the parties by election year. So the last three uh, congressional elections have been what um, we call wave elections. And wave elections 
tend to cause um, a lot of, of, of um, of problems in Washington, D.C. in that every time there's a wave election like this, one party or the other thinks that they have had a mandate from the public to say that things need to change and, and, and it's our way or the highway. So when you see these kinds of wave elections, you tend to see a little less compromise happening in, in, in Congress. So what this slide um, shows you here is the net change in the makeup of the House of Representatives in the last three congressional election years, 2006, 2008, and 2010. So the big wins by the Democrats in the House are shown in blue in 06 and 08, and the gains by the Republicans are shown in red. So what, these, what this really is also showing you, too, is that these are huge numbers, 30, 23, 63. These are, by historical standards, these numbers are enormous. Looking at the five preceding election years, the elections from 96 through 2004, the highest net gain was nine seats. So what... The pundits are all saying right now is the next election, the election that we're going to be having in November, may not be a big wave election again, um, but we still don't know for sure. What you're seeing here on the right-hand side of the screen are the number of freshmen in Congress each year. So these are the number of new members. Oftentimes, I will hear from folks um, saying, well, I came to the Capitol Hill and talked to everybody last year. Do I really need to come up and talk to them again? Well, you do, because this shows you just the number of new members of Congress that we've seen just in the last three years. So 65 new members have never served in the U.S. Congress um, in 2006 coming in, 70 new in 2008, 107 new in 2010. And so these also are historically um, huge numbers. If just 20 new members get elected in this election year, it will be the first time since World War II where we've seen so many new members come to Congress four elections in a row. And I'm going to quick, quick, quickly onto this thought slide here. It's very busy. I don't want you to memorize the slide or anything here. Just feel the slide, if you will. Um, but you see here we have 27 Republicans and 35 Democrats um, have said um, that they are either retiring, resigning, or they've been defeated in primaries. So we know, just looking at this, that we're going to have no less than 62 members, new members in this next Congress in 2012, regardless of, of whether or not somebody gets defeated. These are just new members because they've resigned their seats or um, have already been defeated in a primary. So it's, it, it's, it's pretty huge. Um, so in that, in that sort of political environment and what we're seeing with these wave elections and all of these new members coming here into Washington, D.C., what's happened this year is that we've we're running into this huge fiscal crisis in Washington, D.C. So all of the decisions that are made, being made in Washington have, have become very economically driven. And certainly in any presidential election year, budget dealings do highlight the differences between the two political parties and their fights about differing economic assumptions and, and whether or not you agree with um, the economic assumptions used by the Office of Management and Budget or not. Um, and so in the lame duck session, in this, in this time of strife, in this election year, there's a huge to-do list coming up into the lame duck session. So the Congress is going to have to fund the federal government. We've heard this week that there is a deal. They're going to come up with a continuing resolution to fund the government through March 30th of 2012. Um, but they may c come back in the lame duck session decide to, to do an omnibus instead or maybe do a four-year continuing resolution. The tax cuts that President Bush enacted are going to be expiring this fall. That's a huge debate that's happening here in Washington, D.C., whether or not to move those, um, those bills as is uh, and extend those or change, change who the tax cuts will apply to if you make um, $250,000 or less, if you make a million dollars or more. It's, it's a big debate. There are also a number of extenders that need to be debated and, and uh, voted on unemployment benefits, payroll tax holiday, and also the Medicare physician payment fix, the SGR doc fix. Um, there's also going to be a debt ceiling debate this year. If you recall, last August, there was we were coming up to um, reaching our debt ceiling. So as a result of, of that vote, um, we got the Budget Control Act, which is setting the um, overall framework in which we're going to be working um, on a financial basis in Washington, D.C. and around the country. Um, and that was a result of 
that debt ceiling vote, and then sequester, which we'll talk about in a second. So the drivers of the national debt and why we got into this place we are, um, two-thirds is attributable to new legislation, the Bush tax cuts, the extension of those cuts in 2010. Um, 60 percent is from spending increases from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Medicare Part D benefit, the TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, and the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and then a third is also attributable to other factors, the declining revenue and then the Great Recession, escalating health care costs in Medicare, Medicaid, and other uh, public health public health care programs. And this is just a, a graphic display of showing you why the deficit gap has widened and the projections in the out years. So you see the, the part where public health is primarily funded in that discretionary portion, you see that's going to be rel relatively stable in the out years. But what you see growing is the interest on the debt and then mandatory spending costs. So while these costs are rising and tax revenues are falling, gridlock is ruling the day. And that's partially um, caused by these wave elections and this number of new members of Congress coming in. So this really tight pressure system. And then there's a lack of public support for options. When, when you ask the public in polls, uh, as folks have done, they say, we need to get our deficit under control. But then when you ask specific questions, what programs should we cut or what taxes um, would you like to pay, there's not a real good sense of, of where the public wants to go. So we're seeing um, some major gridlock. We see entitlement spending on the rise, um, a weak economy still, um, and these political pressures as well. And this is another graphic display that shows you where we are, um, I kind of joke when I look at this slide and think, you know, this deficit the United States is, is running, it's really an American tradition. If you look over the last 50 years, we've only had five years where we've not been in a deficit kind of situation. Um, if you look at the top part of your, of your slide here, um, and you see the mandatory spending and the non-defense discretionary and the defense discretionary spending, I think a lot of times we um, in the public health world say, oh, if we just could cut um, funding from the Defense Department, we would certainly find all of these savings. But if you look at this slide here, it shows uh, the non-defense discretionary and the defense discretionary is a very small part of our overall budget. I'm trying to get this slide to work, sorry. Um, so the Budget Control Act of 2011, it was passed last year around this time. This Budget Control Act was put into place because of the debt ceiling uh, debate. There were folks in Congress saying if we're going to increase the debt ceiling, which is really um, talking about what we've spent money on in the past and raising that debt ceiling to account for that, they were saying if we're going to raise that debt ceiling, then we have to come up with uh, equal level of savings. So here we have the Budget Control Act. It did set discretionary spending caps and appropriations for the next 10 years. It was a freeze for fiscal year 2012 and 2013. It created a Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction, that Joint Super Committee that we were talking about a lot last fall. Uh, and they recommended um, in that bill in the Budget Control Act that, that Joint Super Committee come up with an additional $1.2 trillion in deficit reduction. As we all know by now, the committee failed completely to de deliver um, any recommendations in, um, in the fall. So here we are trying to figure out what we're going to do. Well, the, the enforcement mechanism that's part of the Budget Control Act is sequestration. Sequestration, we never used that word before now, but we're all very familiar with it. Um, so since that committee didn't find any spending cuts or revenue raisers or entitlement reforms, a redu reduction will need to be achieved by ac across the board cuts to each program, project, and activity across the federal government. The cuts will be spread evenly each year, $984 billion in savings over the next 10 years, or about $109 billion annually. In January 2013, January 2nd, 2013, the Office of Management and Budget, unless Congress acts to change sequestration or make something, um, pass a law to do something differently, um, the, a sequestration order will be issued, and the result will be an estimated 8 to 9% cut in non-defense spending and a 9 to 10% cut in defense spending. Um, as a result of all of this sequester concern, there have been a number of 
um, associations that have tried to figure out what sequester's real cost will be. We've always talked about the savings associated with sequester, but what will the cost be? The Aerospace Industries Association commissioned a report um, just a few weeks ago, um, and they had an economic analysis done by um, an economist at George Mason University, Stephen Fuller. And I really like this quote from the Aerospace Industries Association president and CEO. Sequestration is not just a defense problem. It's an American problem. And that's really important, I think, because so far in the news, we hear a lot about how sequestration is going to be impacting the Defense Department and defense contractors and, and what that will mean to the United States. But we haven't talked as much about the non-Department of Defense side. There's a huge group, a huge community that's non-defense that have that has come together and is coalescing. We just had a rally here in Capitol Hill to start talking about the impacts um, on the non-defense side. But this slide shows you um, just overall 2.1 2.14 million American jobs potentially would be lost as a result of sequestration. 1.047 million from just the non-DOD area. It's going to increase the U.S. unemployment rate. There's going to be significant number of lost wages, and it will be a reduction in the U.S. gross domestic product. And there's a significant portion of that from the non-DOD side. Oh, my little slide. Everything's going down. So, and what's the impact to have public health? What does this mean for the work that we're doing? My staff has estimated that at 8.4 percent, the loss to the federal public health agencies will be around two and a half billion dollars. We looked at um, the funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, HRSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, we looked at the EPA, uh, STAG grants for drinking water and safe water, FDA, and a handful of others. And that's how we kind of came up with this $2.5 billion loss to public health in fiscal year 2013 alone. The reductions will fall disproportionately on extramural grants. Um, we understand that to be the case from conversations that we've had with the Office of Management and Budget. As you can um, might imagine what you've been going through at the state level, this is what the federal government will, will be working on. Um, it, it takes money to reduce force, have a reduction of force to reduce the number of, of employees because they have to pay benefits out, uh, find suitable employment for them. So when the government is faced with a big reduction like this, doing a RIF or a reduction in force is sometimes a little bit more difficult. So they may be asked to find as many savings as they can internally, but to avoid a reduction in force. So if that's the instruction given by Office of Management and Budget and by the executive branch, then the grant funds would be cut, um, cut more than the intramural funds. So according to the, my staff's calculations, the grant funds could be cut close to 11% or higher or potentially eliminated. There are going to be a lot of policy decisions that are going to be made grant by grant, program by program. Even though the programs themselves will be cut around 8.4%, the decisions within those line items um, will be at the discretion of the agency and at the executive branch level. Some of the programmatic impacts we already know about, um, 750,000 WIC participants will be dropped. This is from the National WIC Association. According to CDC, they estimate uh, a pretty large estimate here, uh, 210,000 to 840,000 kids and adults um, may not be vaccinated through the Section 317 uh, immunization program. 50,000 fewer women will be screened for breast and cervical cancer through the Breast and Cervical Cancer Program at CDC. And then my staff also calculated, looked at um, a good number of uh, selected public health grants and looking at state by state, New York could lose close to $80 million, Oregon could lose close to $12 million just in one fiscal year alone, just in the public health programs. So there have been a, a lot of efforts to avoid sequestration here in Washington, D.C. Um, and the U.S. House of Representatives um, passed in May um, the Sequester Replacement Reconciliation Act, which was the package of reforms aimed to avert across-the-board cuts to the Defense Department and other key priorities. The U.S. House of Representatives did focus because they, they did hear from the Defense Department really early on about what the potential impacts of sequestration will be. So they focused on avoiding sequestration for the Defense Department. They weren't as concerned about um, the non-DOD side. 
So included within that package was large cuts to SNAP, complete elimination of the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Um, you, you all probably know this by now, but if the fund goes away, just using $2012 alone, CDC could lose um, over $800 million of its overall funding. Um, that bill did pass the House of Representatives, um, does not have any chance to make its way through the U.S. Senate. So it is, um, it's where it is, but uh, it's important to know what's in that bill so when they come back in the lame duck session we may see some pieces of that come back if the two bodies decide to move a, a bill. There also have been efforts to avoid sequestration through additional discretionary funding cuts. Um, the House budget resolution lowered the 2013 spending caps below the $1.047 trillion mark set in the Budget Control Act to $1.028 trillion. That's $19 billion less, um, if you can't do quick math. Um, I know I can't. Um, the House Labor HHS Appropriations Bill, which is the bill that primarily funds public health programs in the House, it's six billion dollar four percent um, is less than fiscal year 2012. The Senate is writing their versions of appropriations bills at that 1.047 trillion dollar level. The Senate Labor HHS bill is uh, roughly level um, but a little bit more than fiscal year 2012. So there's a significant difference, a seven billion dollar difference between where the House and the Senate is for public health programs in fiscal year 2013 spending, spending bills. Um, the White House has sent a veto threat to the House saying that any, um, any bill that comes to the President that's lower than $1.047 trillion at overall level that he is going to send, um, he's going he's to veto the bill. On Tuesday of this week, so just a couple of days ago, the House and Senate leadership announced a compromise to fund the government through March 30th, 2013 um, at $1.047 trillion at higher higher level giving Congress some breathing room to get its work done in the lame duck session. As we, went, as we saw, there's a long to-do list for the lame duck session, so this gives them a little bit of breathing room um, to act on all of those things. So what's in this President's budget? What, what are we looking at? What has the President proposed for public health um, this year? And, and what is the Congress um, uh, reviewing as a result of that? Just at a macro level, the President's budget is, like I said, at that $1.047 trillion level for discretionary programs. The President's budget reduces the annual deficit to $901 billion, or 5.5% of GDP, which is down from $1.3 trillion. The President's budget proposes 210 cuts, consolidations, or other savings um, to achieve this deficit reduction. So you'll hear the President say in um, conversations in public and, and, and with leaders in the Congress that if you just passed the President's budget, then we, would ha we could avoid sequestration altogether. Um, but as you know, that rarely happens, if ever. So what does the budget request do for Public Health Service Act programs? In total, HHS um, was relatively level funded, small reduction, but when you're talking about $70 billion, a $156 million reduction is very small. But within that level, there were significant increases put into um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to implement the Affordable Care Act. So as, as a result, there needed to be reductions elsewhere. And CDC bore the brunt of those discretionary cuts. The reduction in budget authority to CDC was around $664 million, or 12 percent. And just since fiscal year 2010, CDC is down $1.4 billion, or 22 percent, if the President's budget um, made it into law. Other public health programs, SAMHSA is down, HRSA is down, FDA is level funded but with a significant number of new user fees, NIH is also level funded. There are some um, increases and decreases within those levels. Um, the Coordinated Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Grants that ASTO works very closely with DHPE on, there was an increase of $129 million for that program proposed in the President's budget. On the other side, we see a, a complete elimination in the President's proposal for the Preventive Health and Health Services Block Grant, which is another program that we work very closely with at ASTO with DHPE. Um, the Community Transformation Grants, is all, that was cut $80 million below the fiscal year 2012 level in the President's budget request. Section 317 is a reduction in the President's budget request, birth effects, but then on the other side you see some increases in other programs, ADAP, the National Center for Health Statistics and Surveillance, and CDC's Food Safety Surveillance Program. So there are some winners and some losers within even the public health programs in the budget request. Um, outside of the budget debate, 
there are all these authorization bills and reauthorization bills um, that need to happen. One program, one authorization bill in the DHPE is working on very closely is the Violence Against Women Act. The original bill and subsequent reauthorizations in 2000 and 2005, respectively, were passed with broad bipartisan support. And so the political tensions this year are making, making it a little different. The Senate version and the House version both pass on a bipartisan basis, although the Senate version um, with much broader bipartisan support, 68 to 31, House version 222 to 205. According to the Washington Post, um, negotiations on the final bill will feature attempts by both parties to seek political advantage while accusing the other of politicizing the sensitive issue of domestic and sexual violence. And so then you're seeing that even now there have been some um, action on the Violence Against Women Act just this week with Speaker Boehner appointing House conferees to, um, to conference a final final bill with the Senate. Um, and so you, you see Boehner saying here we've got um, We've got, we've got, um, we're ready to move. We're ready to move this final bill, and and the Senate saying, hey, we tried to do this earlier, but you didn't want to do it then, and they're trying to make this um, an election, um, a political debate. So it's it's too bad because I think the Violence Against Women Act, I think everyone around the country supports, and I think um, everybody in Congress supports as well. But it's being used as a political chip because of this very difficult, um, volatile climate we have in Washington D.C. Also, the transportation and farm bill reauthorizations. The issues on the passage of comprehensive bills have been mired in determining a way to pay for them. So again, we're back to this issue of this deficit reduction and how are we going to save money. Um, Short-term extensions for both the transportation and farm bill reauthorizations have occurred. So they're, again, kicking the can down the road and, and, and looking for future con Congresses to decide how those bills are going to move. So it's been very difficult to, to see even authorization bills move out of both the House and the Senate and get signed into law. Another area where, um, where ASTO is working on is the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, PAPA. That bill, we keep hearing anytime, anytime it's going to come up, but it doesn't come up because it's just not part of this um, uh, fiscal challenge that we're, we're debating right now in D.C. So looking at DHP's federal advocacy priorities and, and how all the priorities have done so far. The Prevention and Public Health Fund um, was put into the Senate bill at a billion dollars. They allocated the, those resources in the House. The Prevention and Public Health Fund was rescinded, as were many portions of the Affordable Care Act. The Coordinated Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Grants, the Senate opted not to coordinate the, the, the Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Grants and instead continued to, to support CDC's Chronic disease categorical programs as they've historically been funded, but did include language that up to 5% uh, may be distributed amongst those grants um, for some joint coordinated programming at the state level. We don't have enough in information from the House bill to know where the House is on the coordinated chronic disease prevention and health promotion grants. The House subcommittee only released a copy of its bill, but did not release a copy of its report. So we don't know on that line item level what the congressional intent is at this stage of the game. The Preventive Health and Health Services Block Grant, I'm very happy to report because of the advocacy efforts of ASTO members, DHP members, um, NACD, NACDD members, and other, um, other ASTO affiliated groups, the Preventive Health and Health Services Block Grant was restored in both the House and the Senate bills. The Senate level funded the bill, um, level funded prevent block grant at $79.5 million. The House put it back in at $100 million. So this will be something that they're going to be negotiating in the final. But I think we've, um, we've, we've hopefully saved it this year, but we're not done. We have to make sure it gets into the final bill, if there is a final bill. Um, community transformation grants supported in the Senate, um, not supported in the House, again, because of the House rescinding the Prevention and Public Health Fund and not being as supportive of the Affordable Care Act um, as the Senate. Uh, the National Public Health Improvement Initiative as well, um, because it is funded by the Prevention and Public Health Fund, was not supported by the House, but was in the Senate. And then injury prevention and control. This is looking at that um, the violence and injury prevention programs that CDC um, 
did very well in the Senate, uh, had an increase of $140.7 million, and was level funded in the House of 137.7. Um, anything that's level funded I count as a victory um, in this fiscal climate. So we're, we're doing well in a lot of our um, priorities. I think there are some opportunities and challenges for public health in this, in this climate. Um, and I know since DHP is working so hard on injury and violence, I think it's important to say that when, you, when injury and violence is making headlines with prescription drug abuse, drug abuse, youth sports, concussions, violence against women act, Trayvon Martin case, I think the public is very engaged right now on injury and violence prevention and, and making sure that the, that the government does something about it. Um, it highlights the startling statistic that injuries are the leading cause of death in the U.S. Um, at the very time our young people are learning and adults are most productive, they're, um, they're being faced with these, uh, these injuries. Um, and so providing the prevention community um, an opportunity to educate the public and policymakers about effective interventions, this, there's never been a better time than now because of the um, headlines that are, that are happening with injury and violence prevention. So I think that's a real opportunity for us. And we also have a lot of new partners engaged to deliver mes messages around community prevention and public health interventions, more than we probably ever have before. People are really starting to understand the value of community-based prevention. We've got um, partners in the National F Football League with concussions, we've got returning veterans who are, are seeking community services, parents, hospitals, community leaders, small business owners. These we need to harness those folks to make sure that that public health message is being delivered um, to our to the public and to policymakers. And the challenge is to frame this argument in the broader context rather than event by event and draw attention to the important role public health plays in preventing um, these these conditions and and these um, and these injuries. And we need we need to link the public's attention to political will. You know, in this highly polarized political climate. Policymakers are eager to address the issues the public is paying attention to. And frankly, the public is paying attention to issues of injury and violence. They're understanding the, in, that we have a health, we have a sick care system versus a health care system. And they're eager to find those healthy choices. So making the messages relatable and understandable, making those emotional connections over the heavy data orientation, something that we need to start doing. We need to get the public engaged. And I know I'm, I'm, speaking, I'm speaking to the choir here as, as health um, promotion and public health educators. You all know this better, better than I do, certainly. Um, you know, never use words like epidemiologic or eologic. You, you use words to get that emotional connection. And we want to give the public and policymakers an identifiable and action goal, actionable goal. They want to help. They want to do something about them, about these issues. So let's help them answer that question. What more can I do to keep my community healthy? So tell the story. I got this great story from, from Danny from Washington State. Um, and I think it's really important. Engaged public is an engaged policymaker. So let's not forget the public and public health. And get your elevator speeches ready, because so often we're, when we're talking with policymakers or their staff, we have a very short time. So here's a story that I adapted from Spokane, Washington. And I think if I had three seconds to describe the story, it would be public health plus healthy choices equals economic development and a healthier community. So I'm just going to um, go through this. Chuck Redman opened a Parkside Grocery in, in September 2011 in an area declared a food desert with high rates of obesity and smoking. The Spokane health staff and community members were closely with Chuck to offer healthy food choices in the neighborhood. They helped Chuck be an authorized store under the WIC program which is an important program. Obviously, you know this, but if you're telling the story, this is an important program for women and children in your, in your community. Chuck now sells locally grown produce, nutritious wick foods, and fresh cuts of meat. Chuck and his son, John, have pledged not to sell alcohol or tobacco in their store. And within a month of opening, the fresh produce from a local farmer had nearly been impossible to keep on the shelves. It's sold as soon as it comes in, according to Chuck and John. So the Redmonds say that with the help of the community, and that communities putting prevention to work grant funding. It made it possible for them to establish their healthy community store. Support from the local health district was critical to their success. The business, Chuck's Parkside Grocery, has been largely word of mouth, and it continues to increase. So with very limited interventions at the public health level, um, limited financial investment, we can, we can bring a healthy community to life. And this is, this is the story that we need to be telling our policymakers about. So 
Congress is coming home soon. They're going to be home on this Saturday. They will be in recess from um, August 4th through, I believe, September 7th. And so take action when they're home. Go visit them. Attend a town hall meeting or say they're, campa they're campaigning, so they're going to be holding a lot of town halls. Ask a member of Congress where they stand on public health issues. Make it specific. Schedule a meeting with your member of Congress or their staff in their local district or state office to talk about public health. If you can get them to come to a ribbon cutting ceremony and an opening of a, of a new program, they love that kind of thing. Have them bring a photographer, get some local press about the good work that you're doing um, through the support of that policymaker. Submit a letter to the editor or an op-ed. Um, I like to think that the local hometown papers are often better than the, the national papers. They read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the, and the Washington Post when they're here in Washington, D.C., but when they're at home, they read, they read those small town papers, so get something in there. Uh, call or email your members of Congress or their staff to ask them to support public health funding. Share a story, again, um, why public health is important to your state or community. And when we talk about a story, I like to I like to remind everybody that a good story there's a there's a heroine we have a we have a protagonist in our good story so share that good story and and and, and highlight a protagonist somebody in your community that's doing great work cultivate a congressional champion recognize their public health efforts invite them to one of our activities we talked about earlier DHB has a good um, a site on tips to how to implement these advocacy actions, and they can be found at this website here. I think the slides will be available to you if you need to click that, but you probably know where that is. Um, this just shows you um, when Congress is going to be home. The purple shading indicates that both the House and the Senate are out of session. They're, they're back at home, and the green shading indicates that the House is out of session. The green in December, we don't know if that's going to hold or not because of all of the things they need to do in the lead duck. Um, but this is the current schedule. So you see they're, they're not in session a lot, so you have an, a lot of opportunity to see them back at home. And so that's, that's my presentation. Um, the ASTO Federal Government Relations staff contacts are listed here. Um, please reach out to me anytime. If you can't reach me, the Director of Federal Government Relations at ASTO, Chris School, is also available. So I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. And um, DHPE staff, I think you're going to take back over the screen. Is that correct? Nicole, this is Danny. I don't, I'm not, while I'm not DHPE staff, yes, I think they'll take the screen back. I think they already have. Yes, they have, I think. Thanks. Okay. So um, members who are um, on the on the call today or a part of the webinar, please type in your questions in the question box, any questions that you may have for Nicole. And I'm monitoring those questions, and so we'll express them to her. But while I'm waiting for you to send questions, Nicole, I have a couple for you. Um, some people may <clears throat> listen to your presentation today and think, oh my gosh, this is terribly depressing. How can we possibly make a difference? So. Could you tell us about, you gave us some action steps to take, but is there any other advice you can give to us about how we can make a difference? Absolutely. I think that the folks at home um, back in the States make the biggest difference. They, they're, Folks in Washington, D.C. get tired of listening to you, your Washington, D.C. representation, and to be honest. They really want to hear from folks back home. They really want to hear about the good work that you all are doing because they're they're going to be supportive of it if they know about it. So I really think not only can, can DHPE members make a difference, but you know the folks in your community. You know the community leaders. And if it's, if it's not you all making those, those messages and going to those town halls, make it easy for, for your community leaders to do that. Make it easy for them to know um, when things are happening that, uh, and what's, what's going on in your, in your state or your community. Um, and they can reach out to policymakers as well. So I wouldn't be I wouldn't be depressed at all. I think that these public health programs they just need to hear from us because once they hear from us, they're going to say, "Oh my gosh, yes, you're right. We need to be funding these things because it's good work." Um, it's it, we just need to make sure our voices are heard. Okay, another question has come in <clears throat> from one of our members. Are we providing? Um, are DHPE members and others providing and sending enough success stories to the federal advocates? And maybe you could talk a little bit more about 
um, advice for us about success stories? Sure. Um, so the success stories, it's, we, I got a bunch from Danny. So Danny can show you some of the things that they produced out in Washington. Um, success stories are difficult for public health, I think. Um, and I, I'm not going to speak for DHPE members specifically, but I think for public health broadly, public health is, is very scientific. And we like to have a lot of caveats, a lot of data. Um, but sometimes that data and all of those caveats get in the way of telling a really good story. So I think is if you can get some narrative that has some quantifiable information, if you can find a way to tell the story and relate it back to an individual in your um, district, or even if it's a made-up individual, but it's still it's um, an individual you could say, well, this is this. I'm going to tell you about Sally. That Sally is really everybody in the community. Sally is the 140,000 people in your city um, who are going to benefit from this program. Um, if we can relate it back to individuals and make it easier to understand, I think um, that the policymakers will get it. So um, as far as stories, I think, I think it's something we need to improve on in public health, is, is breaking things down um, from a very um, scientific jargon approach and, and really turn it into a story for policymakers to understand. Um, get something down from a six-page scholarly journal type article length to um, a one-pager. Um, take something from um, that's very data-driven and a lot of numbers and statistics and put it down into, um, into that sort of quick narrative, um, easy-to-understand format. I think it's something we all need to work on. Okay, thanks, Nicole. So we have another question from a member um, talking about the fact that most of us have a state perspective. Most of us as members are state um, government employees. And we're wondering what is the best thing we can do at the state level or be a catalyst at the local level? Are there um, recommendations you have for us about impact at the state level? For example, I think about what advice do you have for us about working with our governors, for example? Um, I think, especially if you're state employees, I think that's, that's always a challenge because you're part of the executive branch. Um, so certainly you would have to follow the protocols within your agencies about how, how to do that kind of education. But um, I think making sure that you're part of that governor's team, um, that you're viewed as um, a value um, as part of the executive branch, um, that that's, that's a key thing to do within the state itself. Um, making sure that folks in the community that are benefiting your programs are also um, letting folks know both in the public and with, the, and with policymakers about the good work you're doing I think is very important. Um, I think too as, as state government employees I think um, and, 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 as, and employees that are primarily, not primarily, but partially funded by the, the federal government and the issues around um, anti-lobbying restrictions I think we need to be careful but I think we have to remember that education um, and letting folks know about public health is not necessarily lobbying. Lobbying is when you go in and say, um, I want you to fund something at this level, um, or I, I support or don't support this, this funding bill. If we're just educating and, and saying this is the message, this is the good work that, that public health is doing, that's OK. So I mean, maybe I'm not answering the question exactly, but I think we all have we all have our roles to play, and we under, we need to understand our roles, and we need to work with the partners and work with those um, community leaders to get the message out there. And I think at the state level, um, you're still providing support to communities, and you're still working um, on programs in the communities. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's still it's still something that you can do even if you are at the state level. And at the end of the day, too. The data and the statistics is often they're often state data and state to state statistics. Sometimes, depending on the collection, it is county county to county or um, congressional district to, to congressional district. But I think members of Congress um, and policymakers do want to see that um, statewide information as well. Okay, another question from a member: um, If there were to be a Republican president. What's the prognosis? 
Well, I worked on um, the House of Representatives for both Republicans. I worked for them for seven years and for Democrats for four years. So most of my time um, working in Congress were for Republicans. And they were very supportive of public health. I don't think it makes a difference if it's a Republican or a Democrat who's holding the presidency or, or in control of the House or the Senate. I think that where we might see that as a challenge, because Maybe, may, maybe the Republican or whoever you're working with has not necessarily been as supportive of public health. We need, we need to make sure that they understand the role of public health, what successes that we've seen, what challenges that we're still facing, the things that we can make a real difference on, um, and they need to hear from us. Because if they don't hear from us, then, then it, the prognosis isn't good. But the prognosis wouldn't be good if it's dem a Democrat or a Republican. So we need to we need to get that message out there regardless of the, the party. Public health isn't a partisan issue. Public health is a bipartisan issue. Nonpartisan issue. Okay, let's talk about sequestration for just a little bit. You know, this, as you said in your in your presentation, this is sort of a, a new word, a new concept for us. So is there anything we can do to prepare? Um, I think you you said Congress may take a, take action. There are things they can do. Um, so what can we do to prepare for that possibility? Should we wait till after the election? Should we start planning now? What's your thinking about, um, about sequestration? Um, I don't think it's um, prudent to wait um, until the sequestration order is issued. I think it's uh, very good to start planning for the potential for sequestration now. Um, I think that there are many governors who are starting to take this on. I, I did see um, uh, Governor Gregoire, for example, from, from Washington State is starting to look into what sequestration will mean for Washington State. Sorry, I have so many Washington State examples. Um, but you know, I think I think getting a sense of what that's gonna what this is gonna mean for your budget is a good planning process now. Um, because you're gonna be getting um, getting started with your budget presentations to your state legislatures and having a better sense of, of what the federal government is going to be providing, I think, um, and what the potential loss might be will be a good um, talking point for when you're defending budget requests at the state legislature level. So I have been advising ASTO members and um, senior deputies at the state health agency level um, to, to look at what what would it look like if you had a 10% cut to every single one of your um, federal grants? And what would the impact of that mean? Um, it's not necessarily going to be the case that each program is, is a limited 10%. There may be a little less in one program, a little more in another program. There could be um, the potential for some state grants to be eliminated entirely. Um, because of decisions being made at that administration level um, if it's not formula driven and, and they're doing competitive awards. So if there's few, so less money um, to provide 25 grants and they can only provide 20 grants, you know, you could see some loss. But I think planning, for planning purposes and budgeting purposes, um, if I were um, a budget analyst back at the state level, I would be looking at what um, the impact of a 10% reduction to every one of those grant programs that you all receive at the federal government level might mean um, to begin that planning um, to figure out what are you going to do if, if WIC is cut by 10%? Um, what are the options that you may be looking at? I mean, granted, the federal government may tell you um, you're going to need to cut benefits or you're going to need to cut the number of individuals served, but it, it's, I think, a good time to start planning for that now Rather than for, rather than waiting for it, because I think if we wait um, for that sequestration order, it might be too late to begin some of that early planning process. Okay, we've had a, a couple of comments from members related to um, it seems it's seeming like in Congress people are just digging in their heels and saying no to the other party. And so how can we break through that with some of our logic and stories so that we can get beyond this stone wall where um, nothing seems to be 
like compromise is never an option. So right. any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for public health, our challenge, our challenge is, is we need to make sure that one, one party or the other isn't, isn't digging their he heels in against us, right? So we need to make sure that we're delivering these messages to everybody, even folks who have not necessarily been our champions in the past, because we might reach them the next time. It might be a story that they find compelling, and, and it might be an entree to them. Understanding where the policymakers are coming from and what their priorities are, and, and fitting public health into those priorities, I think, is a, a really important exercise to do. Because, frankly, we cover, we cover the gamut. Um, environmental health, um, built environment, violence and injury prevention. I mean, these are all things that everybody understands. Um, I think the challenge that we have is under, helping them understand that there is a community-based intervention and a public health intervention that can help solve those, some of those problems. So as far as Congress digging their heels in, you know, one side or the other on any sort of issue, I think our challenge is making sure we're talking to everyone and, and, and helping folks to understand um, how public health is so beneficial um, to their communities so that we're not, they're not digging in, nobody is digging in on one side or the other. I think it's been a challenge. I think, unfortunately, um, the Affordable Care Act has politicized a lot of health issues, um, so people have dug in yay or nay. Um, I think you try to diffuse that as much as you can and say, this isn't about the Affordable Care Act. This is about the health of your community. Um, this has nothing really to do the, with the Affordable Care Act. This is an opportunity to protect the health of, of, of your state and, and your community. And, and here are the things that we can do about it together. Um, so I think that's, that's what we do to get over that, um, that volatility and that um, seeming you know, compromise negotiation being a dirty word. Okay, Nicole, this is going to be the last question, and it ties back to um, some of your comments earlier. So related to the success stories or what's happening at the community level, do you think that appeals from local leaders like mayors, county commissioners, board of health members might be more effective um, than coming from state level people? Um, I think both are effective, but always I think having somebody come and, and speak that from a business, somebody who's not from the government, um, a, a parent, um, a, a, a community leader in some way, be that an elected official or um, just someone who's um, passionate about a, a particular issue, they can make a real difference. And I think it's, it's important for policymakers at all levels to hear from those folks as well. I mean, you know, you work in the community, you're out there, you know those folks who just, they have a charisma, there's something about them that people just stand up and they listen to them. Um, you know, harnessing that and figuring out um, how to ensure that they're delivering those public health messages to the policymakers I think is really important. Okay, so a last comment for you, Nicole. We actually had a couple of um, comments from people about um, actually thank you to ASTO for the work on restoring the Preventive Health Block Grant into both the Senate and the House budgets. We are appreciative of that, those of us who um, benefit from that funding, and we all do. And then also the, clearly the work on injury prevention and control um, is yeah, maintain funding. It appears that funding potentially we will be maintained and so uh, that comment came through from a couple of folks and I wanted to share it with you. Well thanks, um, you know DHPE, um, Safe States, the um, National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, a lot of these groups have all worked together very closely over the last few years um, to, to make sure that policymakers understand the importance of these programs so I thank you as well for, for your hard work and your efforts in this area so thank you very much for the comments but also thanks to you all um, for the work that you've done. Keep it up. <laughs> Linda, we're finished with questions and comments okay. for Nicole. Great. Danny, thanks so much for moderating uh, the questions from our members. And Nicole, thank you so much for providing us this important information um, that is so important to all of us. Um, our relationship with you and ASTO is, is critical for um, our membership and again want to thank you so much for uh, spending time with us today and providing uh, current information. 
You've given us much to think about. And now it's my pleasure to announce the results of the DHPE election. Uh, before I do, uh, let me ask you to join me to thank the outgoing board members. And the outgoing board members are Johnny Chip Allen of Ohio, who completed Jane Moore, Moore's term as immediate past president, or as immediate past chair, excuse me. And at-large members, Jim McVeigh of Alabama, Lavelle Thornton of South Carolina, and Danny Kennaway of Washington State. Those you just elected are, for secretary, Jan Shad, who is representative from Maine, who will continue for another year. And members at large are Vance Sparrow with Nevada, Danny Kennaway with the state of Washington, who also agreed to serve a second term, and Debbie Nelson of North Carolina. The new chair-elect is Chuck Thayer from West Virginia. And now it's my pleasure to pass the gavel as chair to your new board chair, Rochelle Hurst of Michigan. This is the time, and uh, you're up the chair of um, DHPE when we pass the gavel. And passing the gavel is a sign of Shifting the leadership of the organization to another leader that uh, will carry the focus of the future and then shall want to give this established new symbol, passing that leadership to um, you for the next year and to best. Know that you can call on your late time and uh, please don't hesitate to ask for help. Thank you and uh, look forward to the exciting journey. I realize that our audio may not be real clear, but I just uh, want to thank the board and the staff for a great year and really look forward to um, the next year with all of the challenges we have before us to continue to work hard in presenting the best foot forward for public health. And Rochelle, I wish you the best. Thanks so much. And Rochelle, I'll turn it over to you at this point for state sharing. Thank you, Linda. I look forward to an exciting year serving DHPE, and you truly have been a great role model. Next on the agenda is state sharing. Due to its popularity last year, we have incorporated state sharing on our website. Wendy will now demonstrate logging into the DHPE website, showing the state sharing location, as well as how to enter the members only area and networking highlights of the website. While Wendy is doing that, please answer the following question in the chat box. How can other DHPE members or DHPE staff help you in the coming year? Hello, everybody. This is the DHPE homepage, and once you have logged into the DHPE site, on the right-hand side you will see your profile box. And through that box you can manage your profile through the DHPE site. You can edit your contact information, and you can visit the groups to which you belong to within the DHPE site as well. You can change your preferences, which are notifications for your email for your account, and you can even do things such as print out a membership card. To get to the members only area of the DHPE site, it's under membership and the members only group. Within this, you'll see all of the documents for today's meeting for the Virtual Annual Member Institute, the board and committee reports, as well as the state sharing section of the website. For those who have not submitted their state sharing yet, you can do so directly through here. It's actually a blog. And to submit state sharing post, you can simply click to add a new post. Immediately at the top is the state sharing template to give you guidelines on how to post your state sharing information. You can see that we have multiple states here who have already submitted their state sharing. 
and you can comment on their post as you'd like to by selecting comment on post and then typing into the text box to do so. We're going to go back to the home page now and we're going to show you on the home page that you have access to all of the programs which we've covered in committees on the right left hand side of your screen and on the right hand side are the news and updates so you'll see different things that we've posted to keep our members informed of what is going on. Also within the members only group there is a forum which we've posted for feedback for this particular virtual meeting as well as sharing information about experiences that you've had doing virtual meetings as, to share ideas and thoughts as well. There's also a volunteer form which we've posted for anybody who's not on a committee currently. You can determine committees that you might be interested in or additional participation within DHP and we'll contact you about that. Rochelle? Okay. You can see that several states have posted information for state sharing, including my state, Michigan. So as Wendy said, if you have not posted information, you can still do so after the meeting until August the 15th. This is our way to network with other colleagues, find out what's going on in other states, and to be able to ask questions. Items to include in your state sharing post are two to three successes over the past year, challenges, and ways that DHE can be helpful. In closing, I would like to thank everyone for attending DHPE's first virtual member institute. The recording will be posted soon to the members only group. Attendees will receive an email to evaluate this meeting. We've learned a lot in putting this together, but some of you probably have more experience with virtual meetings than others. So please share your comments about this meeting and ideas or suggestions you have for making virtual meetings work by posting to the virtual meeting webinar forum in the members only group. This is your organization, and we need and want your input. After the meeting, DHPE will send out information about how to volunteer for opportunities. You can also find opportunities on the website. So we'd like to say thank you for the work that you do every day to improve the public's health, and thank you for spending time with us today. I would also like to thank the planning committee and DHPE staff for making this virtual meeting a reality. So we are done early today and it's about 2.30 but we are now officially adjourned.